Uh, hello to everyone. So formally welcome uh, and hello to everyone. I am honored to introduce today's speaker, Tracy Walker, Education Programs Lead at Canadian Light Source. You have 18 years of experience in education and is dedicatedly working on building bridges between science research and science education and is working on understanding how indigenous ways of knowing and Western science processes can work together. You are one of the board of the directors for Science and Technology Awareness Network of Canada, and your passion for experiential transformative learning was the subject of research in achieving a master's of education degree. So today you will give a talk on exploring inquiry-based learning with students, examples from the Canadian Light Source. And now over to you, Tracy. Thank you, Mirwa. That's that's very nice. Um, so so part of why I asked Merit to introduce me is um, uh, one of the things that I'm learning with the Indigenous ways of knowing and, and approaches um, that is a very big and important movement in, in Canada happening right now um, is the sense of, of being humble. Um, what I did want to, to sort of help you understand that I have classroom teaching like you do. I'm trained as a teacher not as a science teacher, um, but as a, a history, um, English language and, and counseling teacher. And that I have 15 years of experience at the Canadian Light Source. And that's, um, that's, I feel quite unique and gives me a perspective that has really helped build those bridges uh, that Mirwet has talked about. Um, because uh, I came to the CLS, um, essentially just to help them organize school tours. Um, but because that's when I discovered how much I liked science, how much the boring <laughs> but important information that I learned when I was in school plays a part in understanding the world around me, which I didn't, didn't understand at the time. It was just memorize and, and write the tests, which I did well on because I can do that. But I didn't see the creativity and I didn't see the passion and I didn't get excited by it. And so those are the pieces that I try. Those are the strands that I try and pull at as I, um, as I try and build these bridges and find these ways, particularly for groups that um, may not have an immediate connection. So that's part of where I'm coming from and uh, some of the perspective that um, these, these programs and examples that I'm, I'm about to share with you where that's coming from. So I very much like, um, like conversations. So please, while I am using PowerPoints to help organize my thoughts and the messages that I'd like to send, if you have a, a question or a comment or you'd like to engage about something, uh, feel free to um, speak up or put something in the chat, and I'm sure that one of my uh, colleague organizers will interrupt me so that we can address that. So I will um, share my screen. Just give me one second here to get it set up. I'm almost ready. And if I did that well, you should be able to see my, <clears throat> excuse me, my presentation, yes? Yes, yes, we see. Okay, perfect. I'm not sure how to make sure that I keep that screen sharing thing out of the way. Okay, so education programs at the Canadian Light Source and um, sort of where we're coming from with that. So CLS, the perspective that, that we've taken um, is that we're creating opportunities and research, both the machine that provides the, the light that we've been talking lots about this uh, during this workshop, um, but also the research that is done at it. Those are learning tools, as far as I'm concerned. There is so much going on that it's a, it's a one-stop shopping extravaganza. You can find an example for almost anything. Our audience is you. Okay, we work with teachers. This happens to be a group, obviously pre-COVID days, 
Uh, this was when we were able to do uh, workshops in person. This is one of the groups that is standing near the beam line they're about to collect some data on, and I thought it would make a good picture. Um, so this is our primary audience that we work with. What our long-term goal is, is to try and, and influence the way science is taught um, so that it includes more, more research examples, more inquiry-based learning, more of that, that really getting in, but for the students. We cannot talk to every student, so we will talk to, to as many teachers as we can so that they can talk to every student. And it really does make a difference um, when you can do things in person. Um, so the, this first picture over here, that's a group of students that have come out of the elevator and get a chance to look over the synchrotron uh, on the mezzanine for the first time. And you can see the, the awe that that gives. And, and just starting with that with students does seem to make a big difference. And of course, there's always lots of excitement and selfies and, and things like that before we start getting into what they can learn from it. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, sort of in four, part, four parts outline the approaches that we do in the hopes that some of that will be able to help you um, as a teacher. First, I'm gonna provide some examples of um, some of the curricular context concepts uh, within a current research context. Now we've been kind of doing this as we go, so I'll just kind of recap and pull that together. I'm going to show you what some activities are that are available, um, not going to demonstrate them, but give you a sense of where you can go to get those. These are kind of the, the easy things to start to pull in for you. You are already a subject matter expert, you know your classes, you know your students, you know what you need, and you uh, finding these easy ways to pull in is a, a quick and immediate thing that you can do. And then CLS, what we do, and, and this might be a little bit harder for you, but as you build um, connections and relationships, you'll be able to find this too. And that's looking for some experiences that help build capability and capacity, both for yourself as a teacher, and then also for your students. And then finally, there's the large scale projects, the students on the beam lines is, is quite a unique opportunity. Um, and I've heard a number of, of you mention that um, you're aware of the projects at CERN uh, where they do one group every year. We probably do 10 groups every year. Um, most of those are Canadian and now we're starting to uh, include some international ones. Um, and before CERN launched that, we did have a nice long conversation about some of the things that we had learned setting up uh, our program, and uh, hopefully that helped them um, make new mistakes so that they didn't make the same mistakes that we did. Okay, so for examples, you've seen this before. We talked about this last week. This is a schematic of, of Sesame. Okay, so um, sometimes we, we get such big ideas in, in our head, we miss some of the littler things that are easier that we could use right away. So for example, in a math class or a physics class, you're talking about angles, measure some angles, take a look at that, okay? Um, in another similar way, you know the circumference, you know how many bang, bending magnets there are, you could ask your students to calculate what angle those um, magnets need to be changing the path of the electron beam in order to make it all the way around the circle. You could extend that knowing that there's a lot of different synchrotrons around the world. So how are those angles different? Are they all the same? Are they all a little bit different? You know, what effects might that make? Pick the synchrotron that's nearest you. You know, there's lots of, there's, there's, there's smaller things that you could do right away to pull in a few examples. But the point is, is that you're showing your students that these are out there and they're part of every day. You can measure angles on a piece of paper, but if that piece of paper is connected to a synchrotron, now they know that there's research in the area. Okay, so there's, there's small things that that might be easy for you to implement right away. 
Um, this is an example that one of my Canadian teachers sent me that they used uh, as, a, as a problem in their physics class. This photo was taken uh, when we were on tour in the, uh, in the rings. It's the booster to storage ring transfer line um, dipole magnet. And so just using some of the information that's on there, they asked a couple of questions um, for their students to be able to do some calculations. Okay, so these might be some easy things. Uh, you might not have all of the information that you need at the moment, but this is where you could get in contact with, um, with myself or with Andrea or with Osgol or Sakazi to maybe see if you can get some of the bits of information that you need in order to develop some of these. And then of course we will share with each other because we're building a community where we don't have to do all the work on our own. We have people that we can work with. Okay, this is a snapshot from, um, from the Canadian Light Source website uh, in our machine section that gives uh, quite a bit of different information. And of course it continues down the page about, this is the storage ring. They also give information about the insertion devices. You know, these are things that you could use to pull into calculations. And, and you know what? Yes, the calculations that the engineers are doing at the Canadian Light Source and at Sesame are quite complicated, but it doesn't have to be complicated for your students. The point is, is that you're connecting what they're learning in the classroom to things that are going on in the real world, which helps them feel motivated and connected. You know, they're learning what's, what's happening instead of what's being estimated or created. It's real problems. And that is incredibly motivating for teenagers. Uh, this is a snapshot of Sesame just to show you that they also have some of the same information. And most synchrotrons will have this. So it, it should hopefully be information that's easy for you to find. Okay. So that's using information about the machines. Uh, this is another screenshot of the Canadian Light Source website. This is the news section in the under public. And so um, we divide uh, our reporting of the research that uses the Canadian Light Source into these four categories. Um, so that may or may not be a, a really good fit for biology, chemistry, and physics, if that's what you're teaching, but then that's an opportunity for you to talk about um, interdisciplinary science and how we do divide things up to make it easier to learn, but that the real world doesn't divide things that way. Itamar made a comment earlier this week about how his, his students uh, sometimes resist when there's uh, even mixing of math and physics or physics and chemistry or something like that. But it's a reality of the world and, and helping students understand that early might make things better for them later. So one of the things that, um, that I've done with students and we're starting to build more resources on our website for it is to take one of these stories, which are always written in plain language. So it's a good place to start and then pull it apart. What is the science that they, that's there and how can that work as an example for why what you're teaching in class or what students are learning in class is important in that story. So in this case, it's a group of researchers that were looking at calcification around heart valves, okay? And so um, what they learned through it is because they wanted to, to better understand the minerals of that calcification as a way to continue to work on um, treatments and hopefully cures for the heart disease. What they discovered is that the, the minerals are different based on the gender of the patient. Okay, so that's really, really interesting. And there's a lot of opportunities that we could use to start discussions in our classrooms about the curricular content. If you're teaching biology, heart disease itself, what is it? What's the um, what are the pathways of the disease um, and the anatomy of the heart? Where does it happen? You then have the materials of the, of the valves that are being replaced and pacemakers. There's a lot there 
that you could use. And yes, that's the content that they need to learn. But introducing it or showing how and why that content connects to everyday life is what helps the students. The mineralogy part of it brings in chemistry. Okay, why is calcium factoring into that? Calcification, what is it? What makes the minerals different? What is it bonding to? What are the other elements that are present? How do those bonds work? You can talk about a lot of chemistry without touching much of the biology at all, but it gives students a, a, a context for why understanding that calcium bonds to different things and under what conditions is meaningful. It's not just an equation that you write out and that you have to memorize. There's reasons for it. And then bringing in the society, why is this important? Why is it that um, you don't understand how the disease develops in women, but you do in men? Why is it that all of the pictures on our website related to the research team are of women? Is this an all woman research team? Is it that's why CLS chooses to present it? What might the reasons be behind that? Why are people thinking that way? You know, it opens up all kinds of conversations. And yes, it does take time. It really, really does. And that can be quite a challenge when you have a very full course load. But these are some of the critical thinking skills that we need our students to have. So do you do it every time? Maybe not. But even doing it once might open up those opportunities for some very interesting questions for students to ask each other, to ask themselves, to ask you. Maybe you want to invite one of these people into your classroom virtually. Many researchers will do that. Okay, so that's one example. Um, I, I actually tried to um, pull some of their data in um, so that we could make some stronger connections to, um, to that kind of content material, but it was behind a paywall. And so I would break um, copyright in order to do that. So I decided not to do that. Um, and so you may find some issues that way when you do try and make some connections like this. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to those scientists because they can share some images with you that you might not be able to use um, or find on Google. So, but all of these I found either on our website or freely on Google. And so I know that you can, uh, that you can find some things that would be helpful. Okay, so moving along, um, I stole this slide from my science director, so the CLS equivalent of Andrea, um, just to show you how many different areas from one synchrotron alone, you could pull some research examples um, to connect to the work that you're doing. Whether you're teaching um, biology, physics, chemistry, math, um, engineering concepts, any of those, there will be examples there for you to use. <clears throat> um, I see there's something in the chat. Is that for me? They are appreciating your presentation. Oh, so far. <laughs> okay. that, that's great. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> okay, yes, feel free to interrupt me if there is a question or something that captures your attention that you'd like to make a comment on. Um, I, I believe that I deliberately left some space for comments. So. Um, it's okay to do so. Okay, um, so that was the examples. And so now I'm going to share um, as activities, not so much the activities themselves, because that in itself takes time, but where you can look to find some activities. Okay, so easiest one is the one we talked about last week, um, is the salad bowl accelerator um, that uh, is available online and I did share that link. Um, and there's lots of activities like that. Sometimes it requires um, uh, a little bit of equipment, but not always. Uh, on our website, we have um, a lesson plan that shows you with a tank of water that I bought at a pet store. Um, and I filled it with water and I use some laser pointers. I have a green one and a red one and a purple one. 
that I can use to talk about wavelengths and reflection and refraction. And I also have a plug on the end of this so that it can start draining and we can show some total internal reflection as the laser pointer, the beam of light gets trapped within the stream of water. Uh, we have a little video on our website and everything, so you can find that there. Um, this is a snapshot from the synchrotron in the UK. It's called Diamond Light Source, and there are links to these in the resource document that you were sent with the links, the Zoom links to this workshop. So you do have access to these. Um, and on their website, they have some very interesting simulations and animations. So uh, the animations are things that you can watch with your students or have them watch and have some guiding questions and things like that. Simulations do allow some interaction with it so that students can manipulate some of the um, pieces and parts that will direct how that, um, how that simulation goes. And they're really, really handy. The Australian synchrotron uh, at one time, I'm not sure if it's still functioning, but they had a virtual beamline uh, where you could go and actually uh, run some simple optics tests using their beamline, uh, which was very, very interesting. You could book time on that. Um, this is a snapshot from the Canadian Light Source website where our resources are. We have a table that lists um, a description and the format that it's in and the subject areas that it covers and uh, what grade or age level it's appropriate for. Um, and so we've got about 100 resources so far, ideas, um, information or lesson plans that are free to, to interact with. Um, and this is one actually where the, um, the solid bowl accelerator came from. This is Science in School, which is uh, actually a, a newsletter um, from, from uh, it's funded by some, some of the big science projects in the EU. Um, and they come out with an issue, um, I think it's quarterly, where they uh, connect teachers with researchers in large scale science facilities to work together to create lesson plans and resources and they are translated into many different languages. Okay, so this is an invaluable resource uh, that I really encourage everybody to check out. And it's just scienceinschoolithink.org. Uh, I'll check that out for you. Um, so it's a website and you can find all kinds of uh, possible resources and activities. And it's a really valuable community of teachers. It came out of Science on Stage. Uh, and I'm not sure if you're aware of Science on Stage or not, but that's also another excellent um, organization of teachers teaching teachers about better practices and ideas. Um, so that's something for you. Okay. Um, so this is another um, Canadian Light Source program. So this is a different tactic. Okay. It's not, uh, it's full of lesson plans but it's a citizen science program. So what TREE does, TREE stands for Trans-Canadian Research and Environmental Education. It's a partnership between the Canadian Light Source Education Team and um, uh, an environmental research lab that looks at trees and tree rings. So I'm sure you all know that when trees grow, each year they put on a ring and you can see those rings. Oh, there's my mouse. You can see those rings clearly in this image here. So this is a very old tree. It's counting a year for each one of those rings. Um, so the, um, our researcher, the, our partner, um, Dr. Colin LaRock, he, the work that he does is to try and understand environmental impacts on trees and how those rings sort of tell the story of what that happens. So when there's a drought, how does the tree react? When there's a forest fire, when there's a mine in the area and it starts putting things out into the environment that weren't there before, how does the tree react? Um, and sort of different things like that. Um, we partnered on a project for um, one of our student groups actually, and the, this is the group 
um, that you see pictured here, these students were interested in, in investigating this grove of trees that, um, that it's called a crooked tree grove. You can see that it's very twisted and, and crooked, but this type of tree normally grows upright without those twists and turns. And so they were very, very curious. And um, what we did was we worked with the students and we worked with Colin to collect samples. And we, en we ended up looking at the chemistry related to each of the rings as the tree grew. And Colin realized that this could be a very exciting new area of um, research. But in order to, to be able to really understand it, of course, you need some statistical um, analysis. And so to travel across the country to get the kinds of the number of samples that you need would be financially prohibitive. But if we work together, it's an incredible opportunity for students to learn everything from trees and how they grow and nutrient cycles and water cycles and environmental impact and all and chemistry and then to, to send in their samples and get their data, then they need to learn graphing skills and they need to learn the periodic table and about elements and all of these things that we've been talking about all coming together. So in this, and it's a new partnership, what we've done is we've created a, a resource book to help teachers understand all of the synchrotron parts of things and make those connections to the curriculum that they're already teaching and then we have kits that we send out to them so that they can go and find a trembling aspen tree like this one here and have their students collect a sample, two samples actually, as well as soil from the base of the tree and send that to us where the samples are then processed in the dendrochronology lab, in the, in the tree ring lab, but are also processed at the Canadian Light Source in IDEAS. And all of that data is then made available to all of the students so that they can compare the trees that they took with trees that were taken in other parts of Canada. I and have a question, can... please. Yes, Carlos, please go uh, ahead. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there exists the possibility that the student visit the, C, uh, the Canadian light source in order to see uh, how the, the technician or the scientist make the, the experiment. Uh, with this program, we, we have not included visits with it because our hope is that we will be able to grow this program so that we're doing um, anywhere from 50 to 100 samples. And we certainly don't have funding for that kind of um, travel. Canada is a very big country <laughs> uh, and it's, it's cost prohibitive. But we do um, a virtual connection with them if they want to, where we can show them some of those things. And if, if they live in the area, then yes, sometimes they've been able to come and visit. And as you can see, of course, you know, we started locally because we had to learn whether or not it would work. And, and we've learned a lot through this, um, but we are starting to expand out. Um, part of the exciting thing is that this is some of the, the data that we get. Could be, but could be possible if, if we have uh, funding to go and visit a couple of hours in order to see, I mean, the students in order to see the, the experiment. Um, yeah, there's a, keep listening. There's some other ways too. So if okay. you're talking about students from, from your, for where you are, then mm -hmm. that's, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. And when COVID is over, let's cross all of, of our fingers, <laughs> then I we understand. might be able to, to do things like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yep. So um, this is the kind of data that we get. So across the bottom is the data that, um, that the dendrochronology lab is able to provide. So um, this is their growth rate. So the higher the, the peak, the more that tree grew in that year. And then each of these is measuring um, the element in, in each of those rings as well. So based on this, you can see that something happened around 2003, 2004, where we have a very big increase in a number of these metals. And so the other part that the students that are participating do is they're asked to create a timeline of events 
that happened in the area where the tree grew? Okay, when were the drought years? When were the flood years? When would, might there have been an infestation of an insect? Um, what were some of the human activities in the area? You know, was there a mine site that opened? Was there an oil refinery that was built nearby or that had um, a change in how their environmental activities were working? You know, there's so many different things that are possible. Um, and, and so it's up that, that requires the students to really dig into what's happening in their own community where they've gone to collect these samples and start to connect those human activities or those environmental activities with the effects on the tree. Okay, so, so this is what this program is, is about and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, I'll be honest, we've seen a significant decline in participation since COVID has started. Um, and I think that it's much like what we talked about at the beginning of this call. There is so much pressure on teachers. They don't have, the ground isn't solid that they're standing on. They don't know whether they're gonna be in the classroom with their students or virtual and planning to go and collect samples is just something that is too hard to do right now. Um, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to pick this back up again. So uh, they're asked to collect always from the same tree and so um, anticipating questions from international, can, can that be, part um, can you participate? Uh, I, I'm going to talk to Colin. The first thing we'd have to find out is if trembling aspen is a tree um, that grows where you are, or if there's another tree that might be of interest. And then we need to talk about import permits. So crossing borders, there are potential issues, but in theory, if we can address those things, then yes, this program could be available internationally as well and might be a nice introduction. Um, also, and Ozgul, uh, I'm hoping that you are thinking of the same thing I was, there might be synchrotrons closer to you that might be interested in a program like this. We, uh, we this is a very simple, simple experiment as far as um, synchrotrons are concerned. Really they are and it doesn't take long to collect this data. Um, so maybe it can become a bigger collaboration, which could be very interesting because I'm, I'm quite sure that Trembling Aspen does grow um, at least through Europe, but I'm not sure about that. Okay, so there's some examples of um, curricular connections you can make and then activities that you might be able to engage in. Now let's talk about some of the experiences that we provide. And so Carlos, this is where, um, where we do intentionally bring students in to have an experience, okay? So one thing that I, I do want to mention is that while we use the synchrotron for our experiences, because I work at the synchrotron, it isn't just synchrotrons that can develop these experiences. You know, any research lab at a university, at an R&D department for a company could do this if they wanted to. So if you know of companies or universities or professors or researchers that might be interested, talk to them. If it helps to connect with me as well, I'm happy to talk to scientists to tell them, this is exciting and fun, we can do this. Okay, so I already talked to you about, you know, when students get to come in and see it, it's like Carlos keeps asking, can we come see it? Can we come see it? Because it really does make a difference for those students, okay? So these are photos obviously taken before COVID just to make sure that everybody understands that's why there's no masks and that's why they're, they're close together. So they get to see things. This is, they're on the floor. This is just outside the ideas beamline. This is our safety, one of our safety people who is showing them, um, I think it's some dinosaur bones, to be honest, is what she's showing them um, that a researcher had brought in. So they're pretty excited. Um, this is some of the students where we, um, during one of the experiences, oh, there's a problem. We have to figure out what's going on with the mirror. And so, you know, we do some problem solving with them as part of the experience. 
Um, this is a group of students where their experience was, um, it was when we didn't have BEAM, so it wasn't a research experience, it was you're the funding agency. You have money to spend and you have to figure out how to spend it. Where are your priorities gonna be? Who are you gonna give money to? How much money do you need? Are you gonna spend it on salaries? Or are you gonna spend it on equipment? Who's gonna pay the power bill? You know, those kinds of things. Um, and they had to think a little bit long-term. And are they gonna have a teaching lab so that they're training uh, the next generation? So these were questions that we posed to the students who then had to figure out where the money was gonna go. So this was some of their, um, their final thoughts on that. Getting them out to collect their samples so that they're doing hands-on things is important. And then this is a group of students that are actually putting their samples in the IDEAS beamline. You can see the fluorescence detector here. And then they're, they've got their samples prepped here and they're getting them all lined up. Okay. So with our experiences, these ones that I'm gonna to describe to you, they're designed for the whole class. Okay, so if you have, when I say a whole class, for us that is ranging from 15 students to 35 students. Okay, so there's a lot of numbers logistics that come into this. And if you're gonna bring that many people into a research area, into a laboratory, there's a lot of safety things that you need to consider. And then there's also, what are you going to get them to do? Okay, and so this particular program is, um, is not a project like what Mirwad is gonna to describe to you later, where the students get to decide everything because it takes time for them to figure out what to do. Instead, we create a bit more of a, of a I'll call it a, a box for them to play in, but they do get to make some decisions because that's very important for them. So in this case, we said fruit and vegetables because that's safe for students to work with and easy to get a hold of. And we said, go to your grocery store, go to your market, pick up some, some fruits and vegetables, and think of a question that you can ask related to nutrients in those that you can answer. Okay, so students looked at everything from, we have bananas that are fresh, a week old, two weeks old, starting to go bad, does the chemistry change? Really simple, yes, you can probably find the answer in other places, but it lets them ask a question, collect some data. So this is an example of some of the data that was collected by the different groups. You can see that they're the ones making the samples. They get their tour. They talk to lots of different people while they're on tour about their, um, their careers. You know, it's, it's a rich learning environment that we can have larger groups in, but still make sure that everything is safe um, for the students, for the equipment, and for everybody involved. We do the same thing with soil, okay? Because again, it's pretty safe to go play in the dirt um, and students can create their own questions. So we had groups that, that did everything from, um, we have a lake in the middle of our town. And so they walked out into the lake and took their first soil sample from in the water and then at the edge of the water and then back from the lake and then back further and further every 10 meters or so. Uh, in order to try and understand, does the chemistry change as they walk back like that? Okay, so there's lots of different questions that students can ask, knowing that they're going to be collecting soil. Where do they want to collect it from? And how, how can they understand chemistry better? And then they have to read these graphs and they have to identify the elements that are present and they have to understand the safety and they get to visit our... Um, our control room. And so they have to learn a little bit about how the facility works. And it's just a very rich learning environment with all of this. So this is what I mean when I, when I talk about an experience um, at, at our facility. Okay, and now of course, all of this is being offered virtual. Okay, so um, these are a few examples. This was uh, virtual beam time where their samples are in there. Um, doesn't look like these are your samples, Mirwit. Looks like it's somebody else's, but um, 
So, so this is setting it up. This is a tour looking at a beam line. You can see the students that are, are watching. They were um, some at home, some together. This is our science director, um, Gianluigi, who is giving the tour. Um, we have a career corner where we have videos and interviews where students can hear directly from lots of different people at our facility. Um, and this is um, us talking about one of the experiences at a different workshop that we gave. And you might recognize a couple of the faces on that screen. As a matter of fact, I think Itamar is in exactly the same pose. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> okay. So that's what I mean when I say experiences. Yes, you bring them in. Yes, you give them some, some really important for their learning things to do, um, relatively simple from a science perspective, but really rich learning, okay? Where all this started though was at the, at the deep end. We started all of these programs with students on the beam lines. We started because a physics teacher whose husband was the beamline scientist asked if we could do something more hands-on. And here we are, <laughs> we do things more hands-on. That was more than 15 years ago. And, uh, and so students on the beamlines really is a rather unique opportunity. Um, there's, there's lots of synchrotrons around the world do education programs and they do different things with their students. Um, but students on the beam lines where it is completely student driven is um, quite unique in my understanding. So I'm going to now move into that a little bit. OK, so the cornerstone philosophies, these are the things that we've learned over the years are the most important things for student and remember teacher learning. What we find, and um, um, maybe tomorrow Mirwit might say something about this too, I don't know, uh, and Itamar too, when teachers come and participate in students on the beam lines the first time, they tell me that they learn so much about how they can adjust their regular classroom teaching and then when they come a second time, they do things quite differently. That's what I tend to see. And so in watching that process over and over again, these are the philosophies that we found provide the most rich learning for both the teachers and for the students. Okay, it's got to be student driven. The students are the ones that make the decisions, not the teacher, not the scientist that's helping us and not the education um, people that are supporting everything. Now, safety always has to come first. And of course the adults will determine if something is not safe, we will not let it happen. But aside from that, the students are the decision makers. So sometimes that means that they might choose to do something that we're not sure is gonna work or that we're pretty sure they will learn <laughs> not to do that, but that's okay. Cause then they will learn it. And it's a very rich experience. We advise them, but they have the choice on how they want to go through it. It is not a demonstration, not for students on the beam lines. There has to be potential to get new information on whatever they're looking at. Okay, we might have a really good guess, but if we can find it in a peer-reviewed article, in you know something else then we give them that information. And so, okay, now use this to refine your question. It's the same process that scientists go through. It's gotta be collaborative. The students are working with experts, with scientists and with staff, and they learn to work collaboratively and they reach out to the experts. And it is research-based. They are immersed in the scientific process. And then, and this is where um, we actually spend a lot of time coaching the scientists that work with these school groups and coaching the teachers, because it's a balance between educational learning goals and scientific goals. And the reason why I bring that up is because typically a beamline scientist 
Um, part of their job and their role, what they're trying to do is to help the researcher get the very best data that they possibly can. Not that they learn how to collect the data necessarily, but that they get publishable quality data. That is their goal. And so sometimes they will do things for the research group or they will provide information or they will you know, just tell them, no, no, do it like this. Here's what you need to know. And so we ask them not to do those things the same way when they're working with an education group because the learning is also part of the goal. And so take some time for students to be able to sort through that problem and come to their own conclusion. You know, it might mean that we don't get through all the samples, but that's okay because the students have probably planned to do too many samples anyway, and, and that's normal. So these are some of the, the background philosophies that, um, are often part of the every day that researchers don't think about, but they're there and we're now bringing them into the education setting. So these are some of the, the background that we're thinking about. Okay, so the goals, the strategies to achieve these goals, and here's more um, pictures of, of students in action. Um, it is a research simulation, okay? It is experiential. So the students are the ones getting the experience in the research. The teachers are getting the experience in the inquiry-based teaching and learning. Okay. Uh, we had one student, um, it was really, really interesting. We've now seen some of the students that have participated in these programs start to come back as mentors where they're now in university or finishing university and they want to give back. And when they come back as a mentor and they're, they're talking to us, they see these programs in a completely different light. The first one that did that, he said, you know, Tracy, when I came through the first time as a student, I thought it was all about the science. It was all about the science and the research that we're doing. But now I see it's all about the learning. And so it was, it was really very interesting to have that. Um, this fellow, by the way, is uh, he's finished off his education degree um, and he has been um, the, the student representative to our Teachers Federation in the province for the last couple of years. Um, so he's really having an impact on, um, on teaching and learning in our province. Okay. So we try and give the students as close to an authentic and real scientific process as possible. That's our goal. The focus is on the process, not the product. Okay, if you don't get publishable quality data, meh. If you learn lots about the research process, that's what we want. Okay, because these teachers are gonna go on and keep teaching. So they've learned about the process. These students are going to go on and maybe they'll go into science, maybe they'll go into politics and they'll be the person who decides my next funding grant, but they'll understand more about the process. So that's what we're focusing on. The research is a teaching tool and method of student engagement. Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Okay, the education staff know the process of the education and we can bring everybody together. The beamline staff knows the beamline and the techniques. They may not know anything about the plants or the soil or the fairness creams or the cigarette butts or whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, so we bring in the subject specific mentors, which may not know synchrotron. So the only way we're going to be successful is if we have all of these people working together. And remember that our target audience is the future scientists, teachers, and decision makers. Okay, so it really is an investment. It's an investment of time, effort, energy, and money in the future. Okay, so a couple of case studies. What do we actually do? Um, this is a group of, of students who um, 
They were actually inspired by a media story about a researcher who is using orange peels to remediate and reclaim wastewater, um, particularly looking at metals like arsenic and selenium. Um, and this researcher happened to be from uh, Australia, Justin Chalker. And so uh, it took us a while, but we convinced the students to reach out to him by email to see if he'd be willing to do a virtual call, and this is long before COVID, um, to talk to them about his research and help them understand what was going on. Well, he was so excited um, explaining about, it. he's got a, a, a polymer um, that, was, that, that is, comes from canola, which is a, a grain. Um, it's sulfur-based and he was trying to pull nickel out of it. But he thought there might be other possibilities. And he was so excited that the students could work with a syn synchrotron to do this because he had applied for time at the Australian synchrotron and was not successful. Okay, so what he agreed to do is that he worked with the students and with us. He sent, um, he sent material, he sent some of this um, polymer to the students and they decided to, to look specifically at, um, if I remember correctly, Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly which element they decided to take a look at, um, but they did do both um, fluorescence and they did some Zane's work to try and identify speciation. And so they worked with him, but they posed the question. He helped them understand nickel, their question. Nickel? Yeah, I think so. I think it was nickel to begin with. Um, and they found... Um, they found some really good information, so much so that um, not only did he acknowledge them in their work in his publications and in his uh, application for a patent, he also continued to work with this group. Some of the students graduated, but others joined in. And the next year, they, they looked again at selenium. And so he was actually treating them as an arm of his research team, where he was doing work in Australia, they were doing work in Canada, and they were sharing information back and forth. Um, so it was, it was a really, really rich learning experience. And this young lady right here, this is kind of an interesting personal bit. Um, this was quite a few years ago now. She was the doctor in residence when my mom had surgery. So it was really interesting to have that connection, um, just to kind of be proud of my, my students. Okay, so another case study, and I'll go a little bit more quickly now. Um, this was a group of, of all girls that um, came to CLS. They were interested in this deep sea fish, okay? And they had opportunity to work on two beam lines. Um, and I chose this one because one of the beam lines was um, doing tomography. So that fits with some of the work that you were looking at earlier. Um, and their hypothesis, this fish um, is a deep sea fish, but does come surface enough to interact with tuna and does take bites of tuna. And so their research interest was um, with heavy metal contamination, mercury was their element of interest um, that is prevalent in being noticed in tuna is that starting to affect the deeper sea fish? Um, and so uh, just to zoom in a bit on the, some of their data, they took a look at uh, the teeth and the skin and the gills, the lens, the heart, different parts of it um, to try and, and find if there was presence, detectable presence of mercury. Um, they did not find any mercury, but they did find selenium, which they found interesting. Um, and so they did some Zane's work to try and identify the speciation of that. Um, what might be more interesting is that uh, of all of the background research that they did, um, and they worked with Canadian Oceans and Fisheries to get their samples and to, um, to understand things, there were no images of this type of fish. Um, there was lots of diagrams drawn but there uh, were not any medical images. And so this was the first 3D imaging uh, using x-rays and the staff of the beam line 
did present with the student's permission this data at conferences to show the quality of the beamline. This is when the beamline was very new um, and this was sort of a proof of concept. And they could say that, look, our beamline is so easy to use, high school students can do it. Um, so that was very interesting. It was so interesting that two years later, the youngest- I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So, sorry, Tracy. It's okay. The, abs the absorption spectra, what you saw in the last uh, poster, uh, they are uh, and I, and a fluorescence spectra. They are yes. normal fluorescence spectra, no? Yes. Let's say this is not X-ray fluorescence, no? It is, is X-ray fluorescence using the ah, beam. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Yeah. No problem. And so this was the data that they collected. And this was data published um, in, in an article, and they've got their citation there, um, where they were comparing uh, to try and, and be confident that what they had the form of selenium they thought they had. Okay. So okay. the youngest um, participant here, she came back two years later with a new team, um, also working with the biomedical imaging beamline, this time looking at bees. And they had uh, healthy bees and they had bees that had in, been infected with a spore that affects the digestive system that is quite common in Canada um, when you have to close up the beehives over the winter. And so um, the, uh, and what they were able to really show, and again, this was the first time that such images were be able to, to use. And this is a slice, like what um, uh, Kuda was talking about, where you can take your images and slice them. So this is the healthy bee, this is the not healthy bee, and you can see a big difference between uh, the mid gut and the, the cones that you can see here. Is, is very, very different as well as the crop. Um, and there were other things. And again, with the student's permission, the Beamline staff presented uh, some of this data at an imaging conference um, and always with the student's data, uh, permission. So those are just a, a couple of, of um, case studies that I wanted to show you that connected with the tomography work that we were showing you earlier in this workshop. Okay, last two, um, just to again show differences, this is going back to the um, fluorescence work and absorption work. Um, this was a group of students that was interested in looking at arsenic um, and how it is affected in the oil industry. So uh, resource extraction and the processing of that and how the uh, chromium and arsenic changes as, um, as raw materials are processed um, at the refineries. And so they worked with a couple of different companies to get uh, samples and understanding and um, collaborative work um, between what research the company was doing and what students could work on together. Uh, this group used one of our infrared beam lines. And uh, what they were looking at was the, um, the spectacle scale, so snakes um, don't have eyelids. They have a special translucent scale that goes over their eyes to protect them. And it is, of course, different than um, the scales that are found elsewhere or the skin elsewhere. And so um, they, were, they were investigating some of the differences between them um, and looking, doing some mapping and sort of identifying some of the differences there. Okay. So in a nutshell, the programs that we offer, we started with students on the beam lines that's designed, it's project oriented. Each group is unique. It's a small group, the um, 15 is large. Um, anywhere from probably five to 15 is, is workable. Um, it's a long-term project. So anywhere from several months to a couple of years, and it's in-depth research. We have the experiences, which are much broader. It's designed for, for large participation from a full class. It's standardized experiments or activities related to science and society. Um, we can work with soil, fruit, vegetables. We can work with crop seeds. 
um, and berries as they grow in the wild, which is which was developed specifically with an indigenous focus. Um, with more societal things, there's the funding decisions that I talked to you about, and we're working on one related to climate change that's still in development. We also have other programs that are designed uh, with and for Indigenous communities where traditional knowledge keepers and elders are the, the mentors and advisors. Um, although we, we do bring in some mainstream science, that is the knowledge that we're working with on those. Um, and, and so that's something new that's under development. And it can be either an experience or a project, depending on what the capability and capacity is of those student groups. There's TREE that I talked to you about, where it's, it's citizen science. They get students get to participate in a large scale research program. <clears throat> And then there's the uh, connections and resources that, that we have available, but I really would like to extend an invitation to all of you. If you would like to put something together and you're willing to share that with us, we can then make it available for others. Um, and that's really where uh, I really like collaboration in case you haven't picked up on that. I like working with people. And, and I like, I feel that we're stronger together and we can do so much more when we work together. But remember that these programs are for the teachers and, and we know that teachers are for students. So it, it is for the students, but we're working for the teachers to help them. Okay, I'm winding down now. <laughs> Although I could talk forever on this. So if you look at this through the eyes of our learners, what do they tell us? It's, it's interesting. Um, so each of these students on the Beamlines groups in particular have to give a presentation of their work. Okay, we ask for that. Um, and that's really hard for them to do and they're very nervous because they're presenting science to scientists. Um, and so we need to help them understand that they are the experts in their own project. So, so be confident. But when we ask them in the end, what are the things that you really learned that you'll take with you? They don't talk to us about chemistry, about the periodic table, about optics and light and synchrotrons. They talk to us about things like how it changes their view of who scientists are and what they do. They talk to us about things like how important it is to have good teamwork, communication, perseverance. Go ahead, Yester. Yester, do you have a oh, question? No, 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 sorry. No, thank you. Okay. Um, so those are so those are some of the really interesting things that students learn. Um, in this case, uh, there is a young woman who um, is now finishing up, I think, her um, undergrad and going into master's. Um, and what she said is that the students on the Beamlines program gave her confidence as a woman to go into science, which she didn't have beforehand. You know, so, so these are the things that, that give me hope <laughs> for the future. Um, and then in this case about the tree pro project um, is, is, is that you're really asking the trees to tell their own stories um, and how you know, what's happening environmentally. And then finally, this was a comment from a teacher um, saying that this, this program, and in this case, they were talking about, um, about students on the beam lines. Um, it not only educates teens about research, but it will inspire them to fall in love with research. And that was one of, one of the teachers commented. Um, so finally, some of the impacts And the biggest impact I think is that the enthusiasm is contagious, right? And, and so sometimes when, when we're feeling a little bit down because we're working really hard and we're not sure if it's doing what we hope that it will do, uh, and you can get involved in programs like this where students get to play science and learn in the process, um, that enthusiasm really, really is uh, contagious and it does spread. Um, 
So thank you. And I hope that this droplet expands with ripples in, uh, in your world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, you are very welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. the wonderful presentation what? and amazing insights to these uh, programs. And I hope that teachers would have got an idea of connecting synchrotron science to their classroom. Thank you, Tracy. So do we have questions? I have one. Go ahead, Carlos. Okay. Yeah, uh, Tracy, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and all the information you gave us today. Uh, the question is the following, uh, as following. Uh, in this uh, program, a project in a beam line, on, uh, you uh, show uh, examples with university students, no? No. Most of them. Most of they no. were They were high school? They were all high school students at the time that they were participating. Okay, because I, I was, I was, I, students. I was thinking about uh, in my program, the IB program here, there is a kind of extended essay what the student uh, must present at the end of the program in the baccalaureate. Uh, then they have to make a kind of research. This extended, it's called extended essay. Probably yep. in this in this in this extended essay, some student could, one or two could uh, uh, be in contact with the beam line or the the, the Canadian light sources or others in synchrotrons in order to to make this kind of projects or something like that. You know? I think this could be possible. You know? um, yes, to a certain degree. Now, um, part of where. Um, because we have had IB teachers approach us about this before. Um, where there's, there's a little bit of a misfit is because we, our programs don't support individual students. It has to be a group, okay? So where that causes an issue with the IB program is that the IB program requires it to be individual. And so where I can see a fit is if, um, if a couple of IB students were leading a group that was a bit more, could do a project, but they pull out specific information that is for them, um, but, but a larger group of students gets to, to participate. Now that's our programs at the Canadian Light Source. Other synchrotrons do things quite differently. Oh, must be at least 15 students, you said. Uh, no, at least five. Oh, this five. That's good. Yeah, it okay. can be as big as 15. I, I don't suggest any bigger than that unless we have some very specific parameters around it. Oh, but with five, we can organize something like that if they are still interested, interested in yeah. this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then and and yeah. So the other piece is remember that um, I've always said that our, our target audience is primarily the teachers. If you're interested in trying to see if you can do um, a students on the Beamlines project like Mirwet and Itamar are, um, there is additional training that we would want to do with you before we would start with that, okay? Um, this workshop gives you a basis, but there's more we would want you to know and to understand. Um, if you are interested in doing one of those experiences that you don't need additional training for, okay? And as I've told you, we can do those virtually. So we can think about starting with something along those lines. And uh, Massey also participated in one of those. Um, so, so she can maybe speak to that and if that was helpful. <laughs> Good, but uh, one and point of, I, that point I want to mention, uh, my, my own class students, uh, really don't speak English and understand English, then I have to select students in different mm -hmm. schools that they can could speak English and uh, talk about and challenge with English uh, language. It's just my uh, point. Yeah, and that's a really, really important point because I only speak English and I have great admiration for people who speak more than one language. So to all of you that are here, thank you so much. 
Um, my hope is that by working with um, other synchrotrons like Sesame and, and things like that, um, that this can happen in other languages as well. You know, that maybe in, in Sesame, there can be someone who is leading some kind of experience that is in the language that your students understand. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, that sounds like, uh, that, that doesn't sound like there's any questions. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Mirwit, for that lovely introduction and, and um, for contributions from people, that's great. Um, I will not be here um, 